morning. I, um, I fall captive by the old hymns. I, um, I, I think you'd be hard pressed to find words with such incredible um, punch and such deep meaning. I know that form follows function, and many times in the forms in which we're used to, these don't hit in the sweet spot of the form. And yet, there is something so profound about looking back and knowing that our faith is based upon the shoulders of those who paid the ultimate sacrifice so that we could have what we have and experience what we experience. Um, let, let me kind of, by the way, hey, be patient with first hour. In fact, this is probably more than I even thought would be here, first hour. As we moved to two services, I was even running into folks over there going, what, we're having two services? Um, but over time, it'll morph and it'll grow. Be patient with it. Um, and I'll get into a little bit. It's a necessity that we moved offering two services. But um, if you're new here, we're thrilled that you're here. Um, as you're exiting, we want to give you something. Um, chocolate is involved, and uh, it will help you in terms of making a decision. If you're looking at, at um, a church, it'll help you know who we are and what we stand for. Um, give you a heads up, in a couple of weeks, well, actually on October 6th, we're going to be doing a baptism up here. Uh, we've got several people who've already said they'd like to be baptized. If you would like to be baptized, um, uh, let us know. We're going to have a class on the morning of the 22nd to um, educate you on exactly what's expected of you. Here's my idea of baptism. It's such an abstract thought. It's such an abstract idea that when you go underwater, well, there's no life underwater. You're dead. And then when you come out of water, you're alive. You can breathe. You're free. Well, in the same way, before you came to know Jesus Christ, you were dead in your sins. And then when you came to know Christ, you were alive. You could, you could breathe figuratively. You could, you could see, you could hear, you could taste. And so a baptism is a physical representation of a spiritual reality. Baptism does not save you. But what it does is it shows the world that, hey, I, I want to stand for Christ. There's something so profound about a baptism that I think we've lost in our generation. Picture, if you would, if you were standing there where Christ was on the cross and you went up to the cross and you held the cross and some of Jesus' blood was trickling down your hand and you turned to the crowd who was shouting obscenities at Jesus and you said to the crowd, I want you to know that I'm with Jesus. That would be a powerful demonstration to say, no, 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 no. I don't care what you think of me. I want you to know that I care for Christ and I love him more than what you think of me. That's the significance of a baptism. A public proclamation to say, I don't care what you think of me. I want to be known for representing Jesus in the world in which I live. And so if you'd like to do that, let us know. Tell Lori, tell Jeff, tell myself, we'll put you down and... Um, and it's a celebration of what Christ has done in your life. I, Julie and I, began praying over a month ago, just kind of as our personal study time and as we were kind of noodling on different things. One thing that just kept hitting us over and over and over again is that I really want us to think biblically, not culturally. And at first, that just seemed like, okay, God's given me these thoughts, and it's, you know, it's not that profound. Um, the more I've gotten into that and the more I've prayed about that, I don't think I had a clue what I was asking. Because to think biblically and not culturally is a huge step because I think more than we realize our thinking is shaped by culture, our thinking is shaped by family, our thinking is shaped by bad teaching. 
And I think what we think is right thinking isn't right thinking at all. And what happened is I began to dissect 2 Corinthians, and I'm not that smart to plan this. As I began to look at chapter 10, which is what we're going to look at today, this passage, more than any other, I think begins to help us touch base on how to think biblically and not culturally. As followers of Christ, many of us have ideas based on biblical truths, but because we live in this culture, Mixed into our thoughts that are in subjection to God are also ideas that are opposed to God's truth. All of us have thoughts opposed to God's truth, and we don't even know it. That's not a value statement. That's just as victimized by the culture in which we live. And these ideas have their origins in our culture and our families sometimes and distorted ideas about God that we were taught in religious contexts. One of the important factors in maintaining our relationship with God is not just learning new truth, but exposing and unlearning what I would label false thinking that's lodged deep within our brains, that is a fortress of wrong thinking deep within our hearts and minds. God's word is meant to take our wrong thinking captive and replace it with right thinking. That's the big idea of this message. That God would take our wrong thinking, recapture it, and bring it into subjection to him. And why is this a big deal? It's a big deal because we live in the midst of a spiritual battle. And the reality is uh, our enemy wants us to think wrongly. That's his desire for us. He wants to steal, kill, and destroy. And one of the greatest ways he can do it is to invade our minds and take our minds captive. We're starting to look at chapter 10 through 13 of 2 Corinthians. Uh, If you were here last week, you saw the kind of introduction to that. D.A. Carson said this. He said, these four chapters are among the most emotionally intense of all that the Apostle Paul wrote. And it's partly for that reason they are some of the most difficult. End of quote. For that reason, I want to ask you this morning to strap it on. I know that this first hour, we may, we may be few in number. Second hour, will be overrun. I'll appeal to some of them to, hey, hey, come join us next week. We're more spiritual than you guys are second hour. But I want to ask you to strap it on. I don't care how many are in here right now. To get what I think God wants us to get, I think we need to mine for truth may be deeper than we ever have in our entire lives. I believe small challenges bring small commitments. Big challenges bring big commitments. And the more you're committed, the more you're going to be enriched. This morning we're beginning a journey. Uh, specifically, we're going to be looking at 2 Corinthians chapter 10, verses 1 through 5. And if I teach this adequately, I hope it will move us to think possibly more correctly than we ever have. Learning can only happen if we are desirous to learn. And my ask is that you be, act, you be an active learner. By the way, um, you might have noticed as you came in, the balconies closed off this morning. Obviously, for a couple of practical reasons, there's fewer folks, and so we want to push folks down on the floor. But Learning says this, that the closer you are to the point of delivery, it increases the possibility that you'll learn. And so the balcony was created as an overflow. You know, universities have done this study where environment matters, where they take a a, a students through C students and they study, okay, who... Who learns best where? And what they found is those that sit on the perimeter of the room get the C's. Those who sit up close get the A's. I see I have a lot of C students this morning. Seriously, here's the deal. So they, they did this study where they said, okay, they took classrooms and they signed those C students who were traditionally C students and they put them in the seats that were close to where the professor was delivering the message. What they found is over time, those C students, their grades went up. 
At the same time, they took those A students, they moved them to the perimeter of the room, and guess what? Their grades went down. Environment matters. You know, I've had people go, wow, my kids make noise, and, you know, we want to keep them distant. And you know what? You have to hear me on that. I don't care if your kids make noise. It doesn't bother me. Because I want your kids to learn just as much as I want you to learn. And so I, I would challenge you, you know, as you come in, don't be afraid to push the envelope. I'm not going to make you stand up right now. But you know what? You know what you tell your kids when they go off to school? You say, sit on the front row, introduce yourself to the professor. And then you come to church, and what do you do? You, let's sit in the back. Nobody will bother us. I guarantee you, you will learn better when you move forward. And I want you to learn, because I want you to think biblically, not culturally. Let's begin our journey. We start in chapter 10, verses 1 through 5. I believe it's divided into four parts. The first part is verse 1. It's the prelude. The prelude. Let me read to you verse 1. I'm reading from the New American Standard Version of chapter 10, verse 1 of 2 Corinthians. And it says this. Now I, Paul, myself urge you by the meekness and gentleness of Christ... I who am meek when face to face with you, but bold toward you when absent. Paul abruptly begins by addressing, appealing to the entire church. He uses the word you, which meant the entire church in Corinth, which now transfers to us, the entire church here. Before he reveals what he is appealing to us for, Paul exposes us to what has been charged against him. Individuals in Corinth have charged the Apostle Paul that he's inconsistent. Well, no minister wants to be charged that he's inconsistent. And the charge to him is he's bold and strong in his letters. But he's meek and mild when face to face with people. Now, since Paul is accused of writing with insensitive boldness, his very greeting in chapter 10, verse 1, notice, contrasts that accusation. Because he starts off, he says, I appeal to you. I, I appeal to you. I, I have profound desire to be heard by you and to be understood by you. So I appeal to you in writing. How does he appeal? He appeals in meekness and the gentleness of Christ. Paul appeals to the Corinthian church with the meekness and gentleness that was in the same way that Jesus ministered. Jesus' public ministry was marked by meekness and gentleness, and you immediately thought wrongly about meekness, because in our culture, we think of meekness equals weakness. He says, I appeal to you, like Jesus did in meekness. Jesus came without resentment. He came as the personification of power, controlled, gentle, humble patient, caring, slow to speak, slow to anger, slow to offense, consistently above mere self-interest. See, you need to understand something. Meekness is not weakness. Meekness, in fact, is the opposite of weakness. Meekness is power under control. See, it's easy to take your power and just kind of blast people away with it, but to take your power and to control it takes a lot more strength. Paul had authority. As a result of his authority, he had power that was given to him personally by God himself. And Paul appeals with the power under the control of the love exemplified by Jesus. So by accusing Paul of being meek reveals that these Corinthian antagonists have no grasp of the fundamental Christian virtue of being meek. If you were here last week, one of the things we pointed out, one of the antagonist groups that were influencing the church from within were a sect. They were called Sophists, S-O-P-H-I-S-T-S. -S. They were influenced by the Hellenistic movement. They, were, they prided themselves in great oratory skills. It wasn't about substance. It was about their ability to communicate publicly. They loved a following. 
They loved to scam people. They wanted to get paid large sums of money for their ability. And these sophists were more concerned with self-glorification, with their selfish exploits. They were arrogant. And their very criticism of Paul confirms they are persuaded by cultural thinking, not biblical thinking. So that was the prelude. Second, he makes an appeal. What is Paul's appeal to the church? What's he begging from them? Well, look at verse 2. He says, I ask, translated should mean I I beg, that when I am present, I need not be bold with the confidence which with I propose to be courageous among, among some who regard us as if we walked according to the flesh. He says, I ask, I beg you, I want you to change before it's too late. I want you to think biblically and knock out the cultural thinking that has stolen your soul. If not, well, then you will see a bold, strong, authoritative side of me that you don't want to see. That's what the Apostle Paul is saying. And here you see the heart of Paul. He would prefer to use his meekness to get the church to repent than his boldness. Notice the word where he says, there are some of you. He expects some people that he's going to have to be stern towards. Because there are some people that have accused Paul of living according to the flesh. Well, what does that mean? Well, they're accusing Paul of living by the standards of the world. Meaning he doesn't attain to the high standards of spirituality and leadership that they arrogantly claim for themselves. They dismiss Paul as inferior. These some people, these antagonists that think more highly of themselves than they ought. The sophists, the Judaizers. See, the sophists were so earthly minded they were no heavenly good. The Judaizers were so heavenly minded they were no earthly good. And the clash between Paul and these false teachers is a battle of worldviews. Their worldview was shaped by culture, what was popular, what was cherished. They were what I would call wide road teachers. They were just into the following. They weren't into truth. Whereas Paul's worldview was shaped by the gospel, by the gospel of Jesus Christ. That according to the scriptures, Jesus died According to the scriptures, Jesus was buried, and according to the scriptures, Jesus conquered death and provided a way for us to do the same. Paul's worldview is is shaped by dying to self. Their worldview was shaped by um, what it can bring for me, the accolades that can come my way. Theirs was get for the sake of self-fulfillment, whereas Paul believed that, no, 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 you... You die to yourself. You, he believed that you want to find your life where well, you, you lose it in the sacrifice of others. Today we face similar struggles. In the world in which we live, we face tolerance and pluralism. We've talked about them before. Tolerance is that view that says, you know what? I need to view your viewpoint as equally valid as my own. So if you view 2 plus 2 is 5, then I need to view that as equally valid as my view that 2 plus 2 equals 4. Well, you take that into Christianity, and what we've done is we've watered down Christianity. You say, well, this is a way to God. Well, I need to accept that as equally valid as my belief that Jesus is the only way to God. And then this whole idea of uh, pluralism. That there's not one right way, there's many right ways that lead to God. And so Christianity is just one of the ways. And what happens is that waters down the convictions of the scripture and causes Christianity then to become spineless because then we buy into that, that we're not the only way, that, that truth is relative and this is what we believe and it's okay and it makes Christianity flimsy, flamsy. And Christianity then begins to mold to whatever you want it to. Paul recognizes the gospel is non-negotiable. See, we live in a culture that says in this time it is wrong to say that I am right and it's not right to say that someone else is wrong. And the scriptures are tolerant. 
the scriptures say, you know what, if you want to believe that way, that is your choice. But you need to understand that that is wrong. Jesus said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. And no one comes to the Father but through me. It's a definitive, absolute And what happens is it invades our Christian thinking and we're like, oh, maybe we're not the right way. And it takes the spine out of Christianity. And then we live according to the flesh, not according to the spirit. And Paul is kind of sarcastically saying, you guys are saying that I live according to the flesh and you, you're spiritual? That's kind of the pot calling the kettle black, isn't it? So the third part, Paul is going to take issue with their accusation. Notice in verses 3 and 4, he says, For though we walk in the flesh, we do not war according to the flesh. For the weapons of our warfare are not of the flesh, but divinely powerful for the destruction of fortresses. Paul concedes, hey, of course I walk in the flesh. I live in the flesh, and so do you. We get up every morning, we brush our teeth, we eat, we live, we we drive our cars, we come, we go, we live in the flesh. But that doesn't mean the world dictates our agenda. Yes, I live in the physical world, but I don't wage war as the world does. Notice in the first part of that verse 4, he says, the weapons uh, that I use are not weapons of the flesh. He's saying the weapons a disciple uses are not weapons of the flesh. What does he mean by that? Well, when Paul says, I no longer live in the flesh, he means I I no longer live by the biases of a fallen, self-centered, and sinful human nature. Sure, I live in this body, but not by their rules. I live denying the fleshly desires. No, big difference between these antagonists and Paul. The antagonists have these overinflated egos. They're they're extravagant in their desire to show themselves off. And they're always attempting a one-upmanship. Whereas what Paul stressed, he, he stressed meekness, servanthood, obedience, humility, and the need to follow Christ in his sufferings. What's this verse 4 business where he says, weapons are not of the flesh? What does that mean? Well, when Paul says, I do not war according to the flesh, the weapons that I use are not of the flesh, well, Paul immediately, what he's doing is he's calling into question the antagonist's ability to distinguish the difference between that which is fleshly and that which is spiritual. And for understanding that more deeply, it's important for us to observe the next part which will help us understand the difference. The fourth part, what are the purpose of Paul's weapons, and what are they? Again, I want you to read with me verses 4 and 5. He says this in verse 4, For the weapons of our warfare are not of the flesh, but they're divinely powerful for the destruction of fortresses. Then in verse 5, he says, We're not destro- We are destroying speculations and every lofty thing raised up against the knowledge of God. And we're taking every thought captive to the obedience of Christ. This is where I want you to strap it on. Because I believe this thinking is needed in our culture in a deep way. Please, strap it on. Come with me. Smack yourself in the face if you need to wake up. Pinch yourself. Be an active learner. Paul's weapons, he first of all says, they have divine power to demolish strongholds. Divine power simply means that the weapons at Paul's disposal, the weapons at our disposal, they come from God. They don't come from him. Now, when Paul says this, he says these weapons have divine power. Paul's not comparing tanks and rifles and missiles to prayer and fasting and preaching. What Paul is saying is his weapons are powerful in the service of God. His weapons are powerful in the spiritual war that all of us are a part of, whether you realize it or not. And now Paul is going to use a metaphor of demolishing strongholds. Now, what does he mean by that? Please understand. He uses this word, strongholds. In the ancient world, a prosperous city would not only build a stout wall of security, 
But inside their wall, they would build a stronghold. A stronghold was this massively fortified tower in the middle of their city in which they could, it could be defended by relatively few soldiers. So even if being under siege, the outside walls of your city became breached by the enemy, well, then the defending forces then could retreat to the stronghold and make a final defense there. If the stronghold was taken, well, then the war's over. But they would retreat to this stronghold. And Paul claims his weapons have divine power to demolish strongholds. Now, in the context, please understand what those strongholds are. The strongholds are our protected towers of wrong thinking in our minds. Every single one of us, the first order of business is you need to admit, all of us have bought into wrong thinking. All of us have towers that are these strongholds of wrong thinking that we pick up from our culture, we, we pick up from bad teaching, um, we, we pick up from our family, where we have these bastions of protected towers of wrong thinking. That's what he's saying these strongholds are. And he says his weapons can destroy those strongholds of wrong thinking. Now in verse 5, Paul helps us understand what he means when he uses this metaphor of strongholds. The strongholds that Paul's weapons destroy. He says they're, they're like speculations, they're arguments. He doesn't mean that we can out-debate an opponent and shame him in some rhetorical competition. It means, though, that his weapons destroy the way people think, the wrong way people think. His weapons can destroy the sinful thoughts. His weapons can destroy mental structures by which people are living their lives in rebellion against God. His weapons can take every arrogant claim Every haughty thought, every proud act taken captive. His weapons uh, can destroy sin. Sin is rebellion against God. And our weapons, what they can do is expose and destroy rebellious thoughts against God. See, the antagonist that Paul was dealing with in the Corinthian church, the, the Judaizers, they were taking Christian principles, but they were attaching all this works to them. So it watered down the message of Christ. And these Judaizers demanded and craved miraculous signs. They were the ones that were so heavenly minded, they were no earthly good. The sophists, they were looking for amazing, eloquent dialogue. They, they were looking for unexplainable um, just unbelievable, amazing, man-made performance. They were the ones that were so earthly-minded, they were no heavenly good. And we face that today. People who are so spiritually minded, they have no earthly relevance. And you contrast that, there are people that are so self-help, self-improvement, man-centered. They have no attachment to the eternal. And what Paul is saying is his weapons not only demolish these mental strongholds, they're powerful enough to take every thought captive to make it obedient to Christ. That's why he uses this other metaphor about taking captive. Every single one of us buys into wrong thinking, and we need to understand that. And I'm going to point out some examples here in a second. But what happens is is Paul says, I've given you as a believer... The weapons so that those wrong thought patterns can be taken back captive. He uses this metaphor of taking captive. It's the idea of a military expedition that goes into enemy territory on an expedition that's so effective that every plan of the enemy is thwarted, every scheme foiled, every encounter beaten down. I want you to understand something. Your wrong thinking, your stronghold thinking is under the enemy's control. You've been influenced by the enemy and you haven't even known it. And I'm not pointing fingers at you. The whole culture has. That's why Paul is going, please understand this. That's why he's appealing to them. Your stronghold of wrong thinking is under the enemy's control. And so what he's educating us as believers is we need to go behind enemy lines and take those thoughts back captive to think rightly about God and who he is and about our mission in life. 
See, our designs and schemes of sinful man are captured by Christ and brought back under his authority. This, dirt, this verse doesn't mean that Jesus takes hold of people so that they think just more holy thoughts, but that they literally begin to understand their mental structures, their plans and schemes are taken over and transformed to think biblically and not culturally. I believe as a believer, what's one of our greatest needs is to think rightly. And he's saying, Paul's weapons have divine power to demolish convictions of those who set themselves against the truth of God and to initially capture the minds and then sometimes recapture the minds and opinions of those that were at one time rebels against God. So the obvious question is, okay, well, what are these weapons that are given by God to Paul? And by the way, the same weapons that are given to Paul by God, we have access to. We have the same weapons at our disposal. They're from Ephesians chapter 6, verses 13 through 8. They're the weapons of the gospel. That Jesus died according to scriptures, he was buried according to scriptures, and he was raised from the grave according to scriptures. And in that truth, he conquered death and provided a way for all of us to do the same. It's the gospel. Part of the, the access that we have to, this, to these, um, uh, these weapons is the weapon of righteousness. That when we placed our faith in Jesus Christ, he imputed us the ability to do right things. Left to our flesh, we couldn't do right on our own. But because God is in us, we're able to do right things. He gives us faith to believe that God can use us as his instruments in the world. And then God gives us the word of truth, which is living and active, sharper than any two-edged sword. It is the truth that God has given us, and there is one true word from God. Everything about this is true and right and holy, and it goes into enemy territory and destroys wrong thinking and takes it back captive to think rightly. Vigilant prayer, where we can tap into God and say, God, give me your mind. See, every behavior ought to be run through some sort of biblical grid because if we just go by our own human wisdom, what will happen is we will make decisions based upon what we think is right. And if we don't run it through the grid of God's truth, what will happen is many times we'll make the wrong decision and we'll react in the wrong way. We fight a spiritual battle over the hearts and souls of lives of men and women. And if we depend on our own ability and attempt to argue a skeptic into a corner, we will not take his mind captive for Christ. But if we pray for people, if we share the gospel, if we live before people in peace, if we walk in allegiance to Christ, if we pray for people, then we have a chance of seeing people's minds taken captive by Christ. Listen carefully. A single mom begins to be romanced by a married man. He has a daughter. He's still married. He claims to this single mom that he rushed into marriage and doesn't really love this woman, never actually loved her. And this single mom is convinced she's in love. Culture has taught her feelings trump biblical truth. And that thinking has formed a stronghold of wrong thinking in her mind. The Bible teaches that that man made a covenant agreement with his current wife that's supposed to mirror Jesus' commitment to his bride, the church. And that weapon of truth destroys that speculation. An individual has been fudging on their taxes for years, justifying that no one will ever know. And after all, they deserve it because, you know, the, everybody knows the government's corrupt. The culture teaches that the end justifies the means, and it has formed a stronghold of wrong thinking in this individual's mind. But the Bible teaches to be above reproach and to do everything as unto the Lord. And even Proverbs 6 says, the Lord hates a lying tongue, and that weapon destroys that speculation. 
A parent lives under the fear that their children won't appear as mature Christians, and that's a reflection on them that people think they're a bad Christian if their kids don't behave a certain way. So the parent, the parent does everything, they attempt to do everything to control the, their child's outward behavior. But as a result, they never reach the heart of the child because you see the family has influenced them for years. Um, and as a result, they can many times push their children into a thinking that their kids are responsible for their happiness. And it's formed a stronghold of wrong thinking. And the Bible teaches that, hey, free will trumps good parenting 10 times out of 10. That we're not responsible to produce godly children. We are responsible to be godly parents. And that weapon destroys that speculation. An individual strives to live a certain way, thinking if they jump through all these spiritual hoops, then God is bound to give them all the material desires of their heart. That God is bound to keep them free of affliction so that they can live the American dream. See, the culture has taught them they are blessed more than other people because they have a lot. They believe that blessing equals possessions. And it's a stronghold of wrong thinking. The Bible teaches that we are not blessed because we have been given a lot. We are responsible because we have been given a lot. And the Bible teaches you, you want to find your life, you've got to lose your life. And that weapon destroys the wrong thinking. See, our minds are like strongholds of wrong thinking, and only the truth of God's word and the power of the risen Savior can take our tangled, misguided thoughts and capture them to think rightly. See, we've been persuaded by this culture to think political means will accomplish spiritual goals. We've been persuaded by the culture to think financial gains will leverage spiritual influence. We've been persuaded by the culture to, to think human reasoning can overcome marital division. We've been persuaded by culture to think that biblical principles can be used to meet our selfish wants. We have been persuaded by the culture to think personal happiness is more important than victory over sin. And we have been pers persuaded by the culture to defend what Jesus died to destroy. Stop defending what Jesus died to destroy. These are, wrong hold, these are strongholds of wrong thinking under the authority of the evil one. And what Paul is saying as we begin our journey in chapters 10 through 13 is God wants us equipped with prayer, with the gospel, with right thinking, with faith to be used to take those thoughts captive and to flip them around to think rightly. You see why I say when I began to pray, I, wanted, I want our people to think biblically, not culturally. I had no idea the well that I was asking that's a tall order. It starts with me. It starts with the leadership. It starts with all of us to think biblically and not culturally. God, we ask you. We submit to you. God, will you forgive us for thinking wrongly about you? Give us the capacity to see clearly, to love you rightly, Lord, I pray that this first hour would continue to grow. Lord, I pray that you give me the grace to be able to communicate this truth for the next hour. And I pray that this body would begin to think at a degree of biblical accuracy more than we ever have. That we would recognize false thinking when it comes across our plane. And we would call our own heart to it to a higher standard of obedience. Lord, thank you for the truth of the gospel, that you died according to scriptures, you were buried according to scriptures, and you conquered death according to the scriptures. And as a result of that, sin no longer has a reign in us. So God, I pray that we would Stop defending what you died to destroy and forgive us for doing so. 
do a great work in us, God. Recapture what the locusts have eaten. We pray this, and we, we want to end our time and worship and offering as Donald will lead us through that. It's in Jesus' name we pray. And all God's people said, amen. Thank you.